it is a great delight to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Panay and I will be chairing this ISG webinar. I'm a consultant gynaecologist at uh, Imperial College uh, in London and also the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Um, and I am president-elect of the International Menopause Society. So the webinar this afternoon will be on DHEA as an anti-aging therapy and we will be looking at both systemic and local effects. Uh, and I'm delighted that I will be joined by two excellent speakers who need very little introduction, but I will give them an introduction. So our first speaker will be Professor Andrea Genazzani, who has been Professor and Director of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Cagliari, Modena, and in Pisa. He is president of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology and also president of the European Society of Gynecology. And, and he has been made an honorary fellow in many countries, including the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK. He has authored more than 850 papers in peer reviewed journals and has edited more than 50 books. Our second speaker will be Professor Angelica Hirschberg, who is a professor of obstetrics and gynaecology, in particular of reproductive medicine, at the Department of Women's and Children's Health in the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and senior consultant in charge of gynaecological endocrinology at the Department of Gynaecology and Reproductive Medicine at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm in Sweden. Her research is focused on disorders of reproductive function and gonadal development in women. The overall aim of her research is to improve diagnostics, fertility and long-term health in women with strenuous exercise, obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome and premature ovarian insufficiency. She also specializes in disorders of uh, sex development. In particular, I'm interested that uh, she is the official gynaecologist of the Swedish Olympic teams, which is, of course, very topical at the moment. And she's uh, very importantly a board member of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. Uh, but without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Andrea Genazzani to give his lecture on DHEA oral therapy, a fantastic anti-age multi-targeted treatment. Andrea, please share your slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. I will. And uh, okay. And uh, I thank for I thank all of you for being here. And uh, I will speak about the HEA. First of all, and the HEA and the HEA sulfate. Just to, to clarify of what we are speaking. You know, uh, DHEA and DHEA is, uh, is uh, in equilibrium with DHEA sulfate through sulfatase, sulfotransferase, and uh, the origin is mostly from the adrenal gland. We have also a minimal production of DHEA from the ovary. You have here the picture of circulating androgens. As you know, DHEA originates androstindion, and uh, adrenal gland and ovary participate too, while testosterone also is secreted 25% more or less from this uh, glandular origin, and 50% is from the peripheral conversion of the stuff androstindion, while the hydrotestosterone, the much stronger androgen, totally originate from the, the peripheral transformation of uh, testosterone. One of the characteristics of the DHA sulfate is the fact that DHA sulfate increases sharply in adolescence, reaching the highest concentration around 18 to 22 years. You can see in yellow in women and in green in men, we have a gender difference. Men have always slightly higher concentration, but in both gender, this decline sharply and <clears throat> going down progressively until the end of our life. As you know, the HEA is originating from the adrenal, but the major adrenal steroid who regulate also the production of ACTH and, and CRF is cortisol. And cortisol have a completely different trend. You see, we have no gender difference between men and women, and cortisol concentration are progressively rising. We don't know yet what is the cause of this different trend, why the HEA sulfate go down and cortisol progressively rise. But this is. 
And uh, when we evaluate uh, the ratio during the life between the HCA sulfate concentration and cortisol, this uh, is also associated by that slight gender difference between men and women and that profound decline. Similarly, similarly, allopregnanolone, one of the major metabolites of progesterone important also for its GABAergic activity, have exactly the same trend, go down progressively during the life. And uh, there, this is not only the delta-5 androgens from adrenal religion who are diminishing. You can see here from the slide that free testosterone also decline progressively. And the highest concentration also of testosterone are in the younger age, 18 to 24, declining down and also uh, with a bigger drop in the young age, but declining also after the menopause. If we take all together this androgen variation, you can see that at 40 years, a woman, she has already 50% reduction of total androgen. And this drop continues, and around at 70, she has nearly 80%. It's important to evaluate this 50% reduction at 40 when she is absolutely still very far from the menopause. And this indicates that her androgen uh, androgenization is strongly declining during the younger life. And uh, when we speak about uh, the origin of androgen and estrogen in peripheral circulation, it's my pleasure to take the slide from Fernand Labrie, uh, who shows that until 50s, until 50s, the women have androgen coming from the ovary. But after 50, the origin is only from the androgen transformation and metabolization to estrogen. Then, while the ovary is an important chapter for the estrogen and androgen formation until the menopause, after that, all circulating androgen and, uh, uh, and estrogen are originating from the adrenal precursor. And it's interesting to check and to see what is the metabolism of steroid. Just this slide refers to the brain, but you can see that uh, pre from prenenolone, prenenolone can move to progesterone or can move to DHEA. And from DHEA to DHEA sulfate, is the three beta hydroxysteroid hydrogenate who differentiate the origin in one side of progesterone and the other in uh, of uh, DHEA. And DHEA have also to be considered so, as a neurosteroid because it's widely produced also inside to the brain. And from the HEA, the transformation to the other steroids is, uh, shows that it is in equilibrium with the HEA sulfate and then can be transformed by trivetidrosid hydrogenase to androstindion who can be aromatized to estrone, or from androstindion can be transformed to testosterone who can be either dehydrogenated to dehydrotestosterone, the major androgen, or aromatized to estradiol. Then delta-5 androgen exert estrogenic and androgenic effects on the target tissue in function of the enzyme expressed in each tissue. And uh, it is interesting also to focus our attention then the circulating concentration of testosterone is uh, absolutely minimal in comparison to the peripheral tissue general testosterone and the other testosterone content. Circulating concentration don't reveal what is the concentration in peripheral tissues. This is a chapter of intracrinology also developed by Fernand Labrie. Only the glucuronide that metabolize in blood, they represent the peripheral tissue too. And where this intracrinology of the HEA, this transformation of the HEA can happen in many, many parts of the bodies, in adipose tissue, in muscles, in mammary gland, mammary gland and the endometrial tissue, they don't possess the enzyme to bring the HEA till estradiol, while this can happen in the skin, in the bone, in cardiovascular system, in the brain and in the vagina. And then the problem is that now speaking about aging problem and the menopause, there is a place for the placement therapy. I want to show you what happened if we administer DHEA uh, to postmenopausal women. As you know, it's a difference between younger and older. Then we have made the study in early postmenopausal women, either normal weight or overweight, as well in the late postmenopausal women, 60, 65, normal weight and overweight. And if you see, this is, these are the data of the basal hormone levels, 
there is a difference in the HEA concentration and the HEA sulfate concentration between younger 0.77 and older 0.46 microgram per milliliter. This difference exists in many of the circulating steroids from uh, uh, younger postmenopausal and uh, slightly older postmenopausal. And for some parameter, there is also an important difference in circulating in, uh, associated to the obesity. I want to focus your attention on the fact that, for example, estrogen is significantly higher in obese young menopausal women in comparison to the, uh, in comparison to the overweight. In overweight, we have always a greater concentration. But look what happened if we administer 50 milligram per day of for six months. You can see that 70 dosi pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is the first steroid produced by cholesterol transformation. It's not modified. While you see the HEA progressively increase in both groups, in younger, group A and B, and in older, group C and D, then 50, 55, and 60, 65 years. And uh, it progressively increases independently from the body weight. The same is the HEA sulfate. Then the administration is associated with a progressive rise. This progressive rise and the total amount cannot correspond to the amount of 50 milligrams taken a day. Certainly, it shows a participation of an intradrenal extra production of delta 5 endorphin. The same is for androstindione. You can see that androstindione progressively increases in all group of individual since uh, the beginning of treatment. The same is for testosterone. Testosterone show even greater concentration in older individual. And the same is uh, for the hydrotestosterone. We have a progressive and important increase in all these uh, Delta-4 androgen. Looking to estrogen, Eastern also progressively increases in younger and even more in older. You know, older women, older postmenopausal, they have the greater amount of enzyme responsible for estrogen transformation from androstindione. We have a significant increase also of estradiol, while, I'm sorry, while we don't have any changes in sex hormone binding globulin, which is slightly higher in, uh, in uh, older, individual and where in all the obese we found a slight but significant decrease. Uh, progesterone modify only slightly while 17 hydroxyprogesterone significantly increases and uh, a most important and sharp increase is that of allopregnanol. You can see that allopregnanol rises more or less four times, four times since the fourth, fifth, and sixth months in all group of patients, indicating that alpha reductase is strongly activated by the DHEA administration. In the other side, the parameter which is responsible of the equilibrium through CRF production and the CTH, which is cortisol, have a profound decline, either in younger postmenopausal as well in older postmenopausal, independently from the body weight, and another uh, or substance, which is beta-endorphin. As you know, secreted and beta-endorphin originate from proprio melanocortin, and proprio melanocortin is produced from in the pituitary and is, uh, can be divided in a CTH or, or beta-endorphin. You can see how beta-endorphin progressively increases, and this increase brings to the fact that after six months of the HEA, we have concentration of beta-endorphin who are approximately three times bigger than at the beginning, and this independently from the age. We have some interest, it should be interesting to discuss why uh, older postmenopausal obese, they have a, a, a even further increase, but it's to be too long now. Then in the other side, the increase in gonadal steroids, as, as radio that you have seen, is associated to a decline of, of endogenous LH in both sexes, and also a decline in circulating FSH, a significant decline in circulating FSH, which is uh, growing, uh, going down progressively until the, the end of our study. 
When we evaluate uh, to better understand the biological significance, the enzymatic activity, for example, 17, uh, 20 decimolase, which is responsible from uh, the transformation, the ratio between uh, DHEA, prenyerol and DHEA, you can see that the decimolase significantly increases. These are in each group. You can see before is the open bar and the shattered bar is after treatment. You can see that uh, we have a strong increase of desmolase, then a strong increase of transformation from prenyenolone to DHEA. And this is very interesting. And also you can see that we have a significant increase of the sulfatase and sulfotransferase, a significant increase of uh, tribeta hydroxysteroid oxidoreductase responsible for the transformation of DHEA to androstenedione. You can see, you can see uh, that uh, 1720 lyase, which is responsible for the transformation of antosindanion to 17 hydroxyprogesterone, is increased, is increased by the administration of DHEA. I'm sorry, here that one was not modified, but uh, the amount of uh, antosindanion transformed to 17 hydroxyprogesterone is increased. And we have also a significant increase of 5 alpha reductase responsible of the transformation of progesterone to allopregnanolone and a significant decline of 11 and 21 hydroxylase, which is responsible of transformation from 17 hydroxyprogesterone to cortisol. This is what the general oral administration bring F have as effect on the adrenal gland. Then we have make a suppression with dexamethasone and we have evaluated and the stimulation of with ACTA to better understand how dexamethasone can inhibit the endogenous ACTH, uh, what is the answer in circulating steroids, and also what happens if you administer at that moment ACTH to see the adrenal response. And please, look, the administration of the HEA is associated to a greater inhibition of circulating DHEA, indicating that DHEA is strongly stimulate its production is strongly stimulated by the by the administration of DHEA himself. The same happened for DHEA sulfate, and in some group for androstenedione. What is interesting is to see that allopregnanolone, allopregnanolone, uh, DHEA, uh, the dexamethasone administration in this subject reduces allopregnanolone in a more important. Uh, manner than in the, at the beginning of the treatment, indicating how important is the allopregnanolone production inside to the adrenal gland. And when we have stimulated with a CTH, please focus your attention on that one, you can see the response of 17 hydroxyprenienolone, there are absolutely no bigger difference. The continuous line is before the HEA and the dotted are three months and the small line are six months. You can see here the difference in DHEA. DHEA is higher and secreted even more. In DHEA sulfate, absolutely more evident. More evident also in androstenedione. You can see the response in progesterone, 17 hydroxy progesterone, allopregnanolone, and cortisol have the opposite trend. Giving a CTH, you have less cortisol produced, less cortisol produced under treatment in comparison to the basal condition, exactly the opposite of what happened with the androgen. And evaluating to better understand the area under the curve, you can see here that 17 hydroxyprene, that the DHEA is uh, in some groups significantly increased, absolutely more DHEA sulfate, androstenedione is more expressed and produced, and uh, you can see that also progesterone and allopregnanolone, 17 hydroxy progesterone, while cortisol is significantly decreased in all treatment. This uh, give a picture of what happened inside to the adrenal gland. Looking now to the symptoms, we have evaluated the Cooperman score in all groups, evaluating it after one month, uh, three months, uh, after uh, one month, two months, three months, and six months. And you can see that as vasomotor symptom, we have a significant reduction. You get significant reduction in the, in the younger women, not in the, in the older. A significant reduction in psychological symptoms in all groups, and a significant reduction also of the total score 
in all group. Then this effect is also associated with an anti-menopausal scoring effect. And while when we see the endometrial thickness, we have found no changes at all in any group, independently by the fact that they have absolutely higher estradiol concentration, but this is not reflected by any changes at the endometrial level. When we have associated these data, which are represented here in yellow, with the effect of the administration of 25 or 10 milligram, it is very interesting to see the 25 milligram per one year, this is in red, and the 10 milligram per one year is in green. You can see that 25 F10 in a dose-related manner, in a time-related manner, increases circulating DHEA, DHEA sulfate, androstenedione, testosterone, even to absolutely higher concentration, and the hydrotestosterone. And also, it increases estradiol, increases progesterone, 25 milligram, you can see going on after six months to one year, you have a rising concentration of circulating progesterone, estradiol, and allopregnanolol. While we can confirm that cortisol, also with 25 and 10 milligram per day, is significantly reduced by the administration of oral DHEA. And if we examine what are the DHA sulfate cortisol and the allopregnanolone cortisol concentration in these treated groups, if you remember at the beginning, I have seen that normally they decline during the life. You can see that in this one year treatment in a dose related manner, in a time related manner, we have a significant increase of the HFA cortisol ratio and allopregnanolone cortisol ratio, indicating the profound changes who happen inside to the adrenal gland. And you have seen, this is the data of the DHEA therapy on adrenal function. I will show you related to the enzymatic activity. These are the concentration of with the 50 milligram, old uh, 50, 55 year and 60, 65. No difference at all in the trend of 17 adult progesterone cortisol ratio. You can see progressively increasing as basal concentration, but also progressively increasing as total area under the curve of a CTH, then as total response. That this indicates that DHEA affects the activity of the 21 hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase, enzyme responsible for the cortisol synthesis from its precursor 17 hydroxyprogesterone and 11 desoxycortisol. Then it's a profound effect inside to the adrenal gland. And then we have also evaluated the possibility to add the DHEA to a menopause, a menopause hormone therapy done with a patch with 50 microgram estradiol, which is in orange, and 100 milligram of daily uh, micronized progesterone. And uh, when we have add also the HEA, you can see in green is the administration of only the HEA. In orange is the patch with progesterone, and in red is the patch plus the HEA. You can see that we have the trend as progesterone and allopregnanolone and beta endorphin. You can see the continuous rise also with only the HEA, and you can see the effect of the administration of the HEA in addition to the patch. You can see that in estradiol, in estradiol you reach greater concentration when you give also DHA in addition to the patch, and in estrone, and you can see the androstenedione increases and testosterone increases by the co-administration of 10 milligram to a patch. And then looking to what they should be the general effect. Through the green score, we have make an evaluation of the effect of 10 milligram on the DHA for one year in comparison to hormone replacement therapy, tibolone, or a placebo, such vitamin D. You can see we have a profound reduction and improvement in the green score. And also what we have more evaluated is the effect on sexuality. You can see here the sexuality total score, giving only the HEA in red, giving hormone replacement therapy in green and in pale green of tibolone. You can see the sexuality total score absolutely positively improved, no changes in the relationship total score and improvement also in a, in a sexual intercourse total score. Then it's clear that this treatment as also Tibolone is doing positively affect the sexuality of this patient. But we have also evaluated another area. As you know, I don't know if you know, 
but uh, during an oral glucose tolerant test, uh, normally beta endorphin in younger women rise, increase, while this is lost after menopause. We don't know why, but after menopause, you have no increase together with the glucose rise in an oral glucose tolerant test. Then we have evaluated what happened giving DHEA administration. Please, looks like here. This is uh, the beta endorphin after the oral glucose tolerant test in the, in the group A, in the group of normal young postmenopausal uh, without overweight. And you can see how in the basal condition is the concentration. And then you can see how it significantly increases. In the group of overweight also younger, significant increases. In the group of older women, postmenopausal, normal weight, significant increases and in the group of older women overweight, uh, significant increases. This indicates that a, an, a phenomenon who, that we don't know why, but to happen normal infertile individual who is lost after the menopause, such the increase of beta endorphin in an oral glucose tolerance test is restored by DHEA administration. Then, dear friends, uh, I think that the significance of DHEA now we can make some consideration related to the androgenous level and replacement therapy. In the androgenous level, we have an adrenal aging with decreased endogen and increased cortisol, while the replacement have an adrenal effect with increased endogen and decreased cortisol, absolutely the opposite. We have in the DHA is the metabolism affected by aging, while the replacement therapy modify the adrenal activity. And uh, also, I think it's very important to mention the last point, the, the last point where low rate of conversion into estrogen and testosterone happen by the endogenous level, why this is moved to a high rate of conversion into estrogen and testosterone in, in under the peripheral administration. And uh, this, this uh, indicates that we, have, we need to evaluate more the pharmacology of oral DHA therapy. And then we have to better understand why we had the different results between some epidemiological and active treatment studies. And we need more randomized clinical trial. Then the conclusion are that the HEA sulfate is a major precursor for intracrine steroid production. And it reflects, at least in part, the capacity of the target tissue to produce delta-4 endogens and or estrogen. The HEA supplementation in postmenopausal women is effective in restoring physiological levels of circulating delta-4 and delta-5 endogen and estrogen, and that DHEA supplementation increases steroids that are not directly correlated with the metabolism of delta-4 and delta-5 endogen, such as progesterone, 17-hydroxy progesterone and allopregnanolone, affecting directly adrenal enzymatic pathways. The HEA supplementation affect directly central and peripheral level of endogenous endorphin, exerting also an estrogen-like effect on this regard. Then, ladies and dear friends, I thank all of you for your attention, and I invite you to join us at the next gynecological endocrinology conference in Florence. Thank you very much for your attention. Andrea, thank you very much for that superb lecture, as always. And I can see that the questions are coming in thick and fast already. Um, so please do use the uh, Q&A button and uh, there will be discussion at the end of the webinar. So I'd now like to go on to Professor Hirschberg's presentation and she will be discussing the topical treatment with DHEA uh, and in particular the beneficial effects in addition to alleviation of vulvar vaginal atrophy. So Angelica, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is the, the topic of my presentation, topical DHEA, uh, and other beneficial effects in addition to elevation of vulvovaginal atrophy. Uh, first, I have some uh, financial disclosure. Um, I have received uh, grant support from uh, Avia Pharma for a study comparing local DHEA with local estradiol on um, symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy in postmenopausal women. But I have no other uh, disclosures to reveal. 
Uh, this slide shows uh, or illustrates the androgen production in women. And if we first talk about premenopausal women, we can say that roughly half of circulating testosterone derives from the ovary and half from the adrenal glands. And half of the production is directly from the ovaries and the adrenal gl uh, glands and half uh, via uh, conversion from inactive adrenal androgens, such as DHEA, as you can see here. And then testosterone can bind to, directly to the androgen receptor, this nuclear receptor, and exert activity. But it can also be converted to uh, DHT, dehydrotestosterone, which is also active and binds to the androgen receptor. But an alternative pathway is also that testosterone could, uh, can be converted to estradiol through the enzyme aromatase and bind to the estrogen receptors. However, in postmenopausal women, uh, the peripheral conversion of inactive adrenal androgens will be much more important than in premenopausal women. So DHEA is an inactive precursor produced from the adrenal glands and which can convert to both testosterone and estrogen, both in women and men. And this conversion takes place in peripheral tissues, intracellularly. And uh, as I said, in premenopausal women, both the direct secretion of testosterone and estradiol from ovaries and, and the adrenal glands are important. But after menopause, DHEA is the main source of both testosterone and estrogen production. And uh, uh, this could be explained uh, by the concept of intracrinology uh, introduced and developed by Professor uh, Fernand Lavie. And it refers to this intracellular transformation of the inactive precursor DHEA converted to testosterone or estradiol, which uh, act on specific receptors in, in the cell and which are also inactive, inactivated in the cell and do not significantly contribute to circulating levels of steroids. So this important uh, uh, transformation and activity and also inactivation takes place uh, in the cell. Uh, so how was this mechanism of intracrinology discovered? Well, uh, it started in the early 1980s when it was demonstrated that testosterone is produced locally from DHEA in the human prostate and prostate ca cancer. And this was shown by the group by Labrie in 1982. And uh, this was made possible because of the development of uh, the tandem mass spectrometry methods which uh, are highly specific and sensitive to uh, measure low levels of both steroids and also the enzymes that are important for this conversion. And here you can see how DHEA is converted to uh, androstenedione, uh, which in turn is converted to testosterone and testosterone to estradiol by aromatase. Uh, uh, and as by many steroids, we know that uh, uh, circulating DHA decreases with age, as you can see here. And in parallel, estrogen and androgens will decrease in peripheral tissue. And uh, uh, at the same time, the symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy will increase in postmenopausal women. And as you all know, vulvovaginal atrophy is a, a very common uh, condition in postmenopausal women. And it is uh, estimated that about half of 
postmenopausal women experience symptoms of DVA. And the most characteristic symptoms are uh, vaginal dryness, burning and itching, dyspareunia, urge incontinence, and recurrent urinary tract infections. And we already have a very potent uh, uh, treatment for these symptoms, and that is local estrogen, which is highly effective for treatment of VBA. However, local estrogen does not affect sexual function and libido. So what about topical treatment with DHA? Is it effective for treatment of symptoms of VBA? And what uh, are the risks and side effects? Uh, there are some placebo-controlled trials uh, investigating the effect of topical DHA for treatment of vulvovaginal atrophy. And this is one of them. And uh, as you can see here, uh, topical DHA was significant to improve symptoms of dyspareunia compared to placebo. And here DHA uh, has the market name Intrarosa. So there was an, a significant, significant improvement. Uh, it also decreases uh, uh, the percentage of parabasal cells and increases superficial cells of the vaginal epithelium and also uh, decrease in vaginal pH. So all both, um, uh, both objective and subjective symptoms of VBA. And we have also evidence from a meta-analysis uh, uh, here based on four studies showing efficacy of topical DHA on the symptom of dyspareunia, uh, as you can see here. And also for vaginal dryness, uh, there is evidence of symptom relief compared to placebo. So we have we know we now have evidence that DHEA is effective for treatment of DVA, but what about safety and uh, maybe side effects? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, what about systemic absorption? Here you can see that DHA itself, uh, that it was a significant, a small but significant increase in uh, circulating DHA after topical treatment. However, the level was well below uh, the 90, 95 uh, uh, percentage uh, percentile of the normal range of DHA and in postmenopausal women, as you can see here. And here, here you have the, the normal range. And what about estradiol? Uh, there was no significant increase in systemic estradiol after topical treatment with DHA. However, testosterone, there was a small increase in testosterone, circulating testosterone. But once more, like for DHEA, uh, this level is much lower than the upper normal limit for postmenopausal women, which is here. So the systemic absorption is, is seen not to be of clinical significance. What about endometrial safety with topical DHEA? Well, we know that by some reason, the endometrium lacks aromatase, this important enzyme converting testosterone to estradiol. And this is in contrast to vagina. And uh, there is evidence that uh, um, topical DHEA do not um, affect the endometrium based on more than 600 women treated for one year. And uh, all of these women had atrophic or inactive uh, endometrium after one year of treatment. 
But what about breast safety? Well, there are no reported risks of breast cancer. And one randomized controlled trial um, on postmenopausal women with breast or gynecological cancer, they had symptom relief um, uh, after 12 weeks of treatment with topical DHEA. And there was no evidence of supraphysiological uh, sex steroid levels. However, long-term studies on breast safety are lacking. So we, today we have no uh, clear evidence of breast safety with this treatment. But uh, topical DHA is a registered drug and the name is Intrarosa, 6.5 milligram pessary, uh, administered daily. And it was first approved by FDA 2016 on the indication moderate to severe dyspareunia, a symptom of vulvar and vaginal atrophy due to menopause. And the contraindications to FDA is undiagnosed abnormal vaginal bleeding. EMA gave approval 2018 and with a slightly different indication, namely moderate to severe vul vulvovaginal atrophy in postmenopausal women. But here they have evaluated safety different, differently. Uh, so contraindications according to EMA is vagin vaginal bleeding of unclear cause, endometrial hyperplasia, current or previous breast cancer, liver disease, current or previous venous or arterial thrombosis, and porphyria. I think it's rather interesting that uh, uh, EMA and FDA have um, uh, considered the contraindication so differently. So the question is then, what do androgens in DHEA add uh, to estrogen when treating uh, VVA in postmenopausal women? Well, animal studies have demonstrated androgenic actions of DHEA. Uh, and it has been shown an increased thickness of the vaginal epithelium increased density of collagen fibers and thickness of lamina propria, increase of the muscular layer and specifically of nerve endings of the vagina, and increased vaginal weight. And here you can see uh, the morphological changes. So this is a vaginal ball and you have, uh, and, and this is in rat, rat vagina. And here's the epithelium, lamina propria, and the muscle layer. And after ovarectomy, uh, you can see that uh, the, the wall becomes uh, atrophic. Uh, but with treatment with DHEA, uh, it will regenerate, as you can see here. And if you also add an anti-estrogen, you can see the specific androgen effect. And then you can see that specifically lamina, lamina propria increases. And it was also demonstrated an increase in nerve endings related to the androgen component of DHA treatment uh, of rats. But what about women? Can topical DHA have a positive effect, for instance, on sexuality of women with VVA? And uh, there are two placebo-controlled trials investigating the effect of topical DHA on sexuality in postmenopausal women with VVA. And in this study, they used the uh, FFI, uh, FFI um, questionnaire. Uh, and as you can see here, there was um, an increase in desire, arousal, and lubrication. And there was also a significant increase in orgasm, satisfaction, 
and a decrease in pain uh, related to intercourse uh, compared to placebo. So this looks like a, a, a clear positive effect on sexual function by topical treatment with DHEA in postmenopausal women. So in conclusion, uh, topical DHEA uh, is an effective treatment for symptoms of VVA. We have evidence for that from several placebo-controlled trials. And the treatment uh, maintains normal postmenopausal serum concentration of steroids. Estradiol seems not to increase significantly, but uh, DJ uh, in itself and testosterone uh, may increase a little bit. Uh, the only side effect uh, reported is actually increased uh, vaginal discharge. And there is evidence of endometrial safety, but we lack long-term data on breast safety. Uh, topical DHA appears to have a positive effect on sexual function. And one possible mechanism could be stimulation of vaginal nerve fibers and muscles by the androgen component that has been uh, suggested. Um, and actually we have now an ongoing study, a, a placebo controlled um, a study comparing also the effect of uh, uh, topical DHEA and topical estrogen for both symptoms of EVA and sexual function. So I think that that will be very exciting to see the results of. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Angelica, for a fascinating uh, lecture uh, on topical DHEA. Uh, and I think a number of us now have had some experience of using it and uh, are finding that uh, it is quite efficacious uh, for our patients. Um, so we've had a very great response to the, uh, both the lectures in terms of uh, questions. Um, so I'd like to spend the next uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, in discussion, if I may. And perhaps I could start uh, with Andrea. Uh, when you decide to suggest a DHEA supplement, how do you select the daily dosage? And uh, there's also a question of uh, how can you get it in Italy? Um, <laughs> some, somebody's wondering how you're managing to access it. Yes, in Italy now it's quite difficult because they have uh, forbidden to the pharmacy to make it as a generic because we don't have the, as an ethical product, but we can buy by internet. Okay, I think the, the amount to be used is depending from the human concentration of the HA sulfate. I would like to link the, the, the total the amount administered per day to the lack of endogenous DHEA sulfate, not so much of DHEA, but of DHEA sulfate. I think that if the women they have less than one microgram per milliliter or one milligram per liter, we can start with a dose of 25 milligram a day, planting the dose in function of the progressive increase, because you have seen that going on uh, after three, four, five, six months, the endogenous concentration also participate. Then at that the time we reduce the concentration of the oral administration, following always on, on the basis of circulating DHA sulfate. So does that mean that you could actually potentially even stop it and have an ongoing endogenous production? Yes, we have, uh, okay, we have not published, but we have seen that one in some subjects, because we have many patients treated since long years. And what we have seen that after the interruption, we have a, a, progress, a slow but progressive decline. And after nearly mm. uh, two months, three months after the end of the administration, you go back to concentration expected for the age of the individual, or in any case, significantly lower than that that you have reached giving uh, the oral administration. And Angelica, with the prasterone, it's a 6.5 milligram uh, pessary, um, and it's recommended to insert it uh, nightly or, or daily. Yeah. But um, 
do you have any experience of using it less frequently in patients? Because I've had some patients that do complain of the discharge if they use it every night. Mm, absolutely. I mean, uh, we all know that patients do what they like and what they prefer. <laughs> so actually, many women, they after a while try to reduce the dose and maybe take it uh, twice a week or three times a week and, and it can work. So uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it's the same like uh, topical estrogen that you can reduce the dose. Uh, but um, uh, as for topical estrogen, sometimes twice a week could be too little and you have to increase the dose. So it, it's uh, the individual uh, need here, which is important. No. I have a question to Professor Genasani, but maybe I should Please. <laughs> of course. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Speaker's prerogative. Uh, no, I was thinking about side effects of systemic uh, DGA and mm. women, uh, because uh, some women, they can complain of different side effects, with, yeah. like uh, oily skin and... and yes. um, no, no. And, and in fact, th th this is a question that's been asked by a number of our uh, delegates, uh, yeah. particularly asking about hirsutism and acne. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, people want reassurance about breast and cardiovascular, etc. Yes, okay. Uh, going to the, to the skin effect, I think, uh, as you have seen, we have uh, uh, a continuous, a progressive increase also of circulating testosterone and diol, and testosterone can easily reach concentration above the physiological female levels. And then in those patients who have a greater sensitivity or who reach greater concentration, we reduce the dose. If you reduce the dose, you have, you need some time, but you have a lowering also of all the other parameters. Then we go easily back from 25 to 20 or 15 or 10, and it's also so of even lower concentration. This depends from the women, the, from the individual sensitivity of the woman. Mm. Mm. And how do you uh, monitor the levels um, in terms of uh, ensuring adequate levels for efficacy and also uh, safety? Yes, okay. In our protocol, normally at the beginning, we monitor with an evaluation every six months because you have seen they are not acute changes every six months, and then we go to concentration uh, to evaluate it every, every year. Concerning the safety aspect, because the safety aspect, I would like also to focus the attention that in women, it's one part is in men, but also in women. In, in women, we have seen also interesting data by Tommaso and other, also on positive effect on the vascular aspects. We have positive effect on nitric oxide production. And also, I would like to mention that in these studies, Tommaso, uh, we published in endocrinology in 2003, uh, we found that, that this effect are directly done by DHEA. Even if you block uh, the estradiol receptor or the androgen receptor or the glucocorticoid receptor, we maintain the effect on endothelial cells. And then uh, at that time we were, uh, we, uh, still we remain, we are still suggesting the possibility that uh, we can have a uh, uh, DHEA receptor. As you know, it has not been cloned. But there are very few persons who have tried to evaluate the existence of a direct DHEA mm, receptor. Mm. And actually, this is a question that Frederick Naftalin asked. <laughs> um, is it a hormone or is it a precursor to hormones? Um, you know, so I, I think the crucial question which you've um, um, that, raise here is, you know, is there a receptor for DHEA? Yes, in, in, in that study we found that the DHEA on the vascular level, it have also a genomic effect, but also a non-genomic effect, mm -hmm. uh, that, that this non-genomic effect. But we were not able to block this independently by the use of all the antagonists that we had tried at that moment. Then we believe that probably a DHEA receptor also can exist, but they have to be uh, studied <laughs> and look about. But, but may I just yeah. ask, was the effect reduced when you blocked it? Or was it at the No, same? no, it was, uh, it remained the same. It remained the same. Well, it remained the same. You know, uh, the, the changes, if you go the changes between the, without, with or without uh, the inhibition, the changes 
changes are minimal, are linked to the experiment, you know, but they are not, you know, you lose 30% or 40% of the activity. And when we have evaluated the concentration of estradiol and the concentration of androgen in the tissue exposed, uh, in the cells exposed to the DHEA, in fact, we have not found in, in significant increase in local, extra, in, con, in concentration of estradiol or of testosterone. Mm. Then we were, in that paper, we were more uh, in favor of the possibility that uh, it is also uh, something who makes the HA active by its own. And there's a question about uh, bleeding, but I think, Angelica, you showed due to the lack of aromatase activity in the endometrium, yeah. it's un very unlikely to lead to bleeding. Um, yeah, and not to my clinical experience either. I've never yes. seen uh, a bleeding after topical. Yes. Yeah, never. Somebody asks if there's a liver effect, uh, and, and uh, either pro procoagulant or on lipids. We, we by topical or by systemic? By systemic, by, systemic. by systemic, we have not found. We were looking yeah. to the, all the clinical parameters normally um, and that normally we do also to evaluate the estrogen effect, for example, also the old the system of procoagulating or anti or fibrinolytic systems, and we have not found any changes about. Uh, a wonderful question, because I have a particular interest in this, is the impact on allopregnenolone levels. So if you see an improvement, yes. is it possible that it might be used as a therapeutic intervention for PMS, PMDD? And are there any data for this? And Andre Milovitz is one of the paid people that's asked that. Yes, I, I think you know, the data for allopregnenolone are the more clear than any other. Eh? Uh, we have a profound increase of allopregnanolone and also a profound increase in beta endorphin. Then I think uh, we can uh, use, we are using the HEA in women who under oral contraceptive, they have a decline of endogenous DHEA sulfate. You know, uh, oral contraceptive as any other estrogenic treatment reduces the amount of androgen produced by the adrenal gland. In some mm -hmm. women who are uh, under contraception, they complain the lack of sexual interest in sexuality, also by the increase of the binding protein and so on, and who have, and who have also lower DHA sulfate. You found in some of them concentration of DHA sulfate, normally for individuals who have 30 years more in comparison to their age, then we give a DHA supplementation. And it's a beautiful study of Harry and Kulin Benning and uh, the Pantare group, on the androgen restored contraception using 50 milligram DHEA together with the uh, contraceptive with the phenylestradiol and levonorgestrel. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We have published. And they're interesting because the ego using a dosage that you have seen who really potentiate the endogenous androgenic milieu. And then I think this is another uh, chapter that we have to explore more. Hmm. Really? Yeah, there's a comment here that uh, one of our delegates, uh, Dr. Dewan, uses it sublingually and has had a positive experience. Um, Possibly, you know, sublingual administration yeah. make a, a direct transfer to circulating, uh, to general circulation, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these theories are easily absorbed. Angelica, an interesting question, again, from Professor Naftalin. If you used DHEA, uh, prasterone in a woman on aromatase inhibitors, would that prevent the or reduce the efficacy of the treatment? Do we have any evidence or experience of this? Uh, uh, this is a very good question <laughs> uh, and I would like to test it, but uh, I don't uh, have any experience of it and, and uh, uh, that would be really interesting, but uh, if the if DHEA has its own effect, we don't know. That, that would really be interesting to study. Mm. Uh, and in fact, in connection with that, there is a question about, uh, you know, whether it can be used in breast cancer patients. Mm. Uh, I believe that uh, EMA is stricter about this than uh, FDA on that issue. I mean, according to FDA, it's okay to use it in, in breast cancer patients. And as far as I know, uh, they they planned for a study in breast cancer patients, but I'm not sure that it really started 
uh, but it was a study planned uh, in the US and Canada. Uh, and um, I mean, uh, based on the very, very minimal systemic absorption, uh, I personally, I believe it's safe, but of, of course we need data on this and we don't mm. have any data. So, so it's, uh, it's important to, to get some data for breast yeah. If I can add, if I can add something on this, you have seen the difference between FDA and EMA. I was part of the delegation who, who was discussing with EMA about that one, and they were believing they have put uh, their uh, uh, attention to the fact that there's still not yet data published in these patients. They uh, they agree with FDA that all data are in favor that they have no effect, mm. but uh, they require a specific study. Then we are waiting the study yeah. that you are mentioning. To yeah. be published and to demonstrate or not the the security. The problem is the recurrency, you know, because the recurrency of the breast cancer sometimes have take ten years. Mm. And then in all these experiments, they are done in shorter time, yeah. and this is a tumor. Well, only that, twelve weeks. <laughs> yes, yes, and this is a tumor mm -hmm. who sometimes have a recurrence many years after. And then in this population of long-term waiting individual who will develop later on uh, uh, breast cancer again, it's very difficult to have a so long study to demonstrate the, uh, ineff the efficiency or inefficiency of this. Mm, sure. A question that's often asked is uh, the uh, impact of DHEA in premature ovarian insufficiency or in uh, uh, poor responders to fertility treatment. Uh, do either of you we have, have a we view, have data. view on that? We have data. We have data. Yeah. Paolo Artini was publishing a data also that were very positive. The long term treatment, at least four months before the pickup, increases the number of oocyte collection, of mature oocyte collection, and the number of pregnancy. But, but in our <coughs> study, we have the bias that we selected all individual with endogenous DHEA sulfate at low concentration. Mm -hmm. If you take a person who already have the normal DHEA sulfate, <coughs> I don't, I'm not sure that the results will be the same. But in those who have low DHEA sulfate, Artini demonstrate clearly that the pretreatment of four months with 50 milligram a day of DHEA increases the number of mature oocyte collected and the number of embryo and the number of pregnancies. What would the mechanism be for this uh, positive effect? Yeah, also, first of all, that also you have the HEA in the follicular fluid, in the, in, the, in the follicular fluid is also present. It's mm -hmm. one of the components. We don't know, we don't know why, we don't know. You know uh, I cannot answer to that question, but only that those who have already reduced, because you have to remember, the HEA is uh, is uh, uh, is linked to the yacht of the individual. The greater concentration are around say 16, 17, 18 years. Then they go down progressively. But this going down is faster in some individual. You have individual of 25 years who have already less than one microgram per milliliter, which is one third of the normal expected concentration. And as the HEA is also present inside to the follicular fluid and and also i don't i don't know uh, paolo you know you know better than me but uh, there are some studies also who show that um, uh, embryo tissues can uh, can uh, can uh, metabolize the hea but i'm not sure on that point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a question about the skeletal effects of DHEA. Um, you have some data on that. Yes, yes, we have some data on BMI. Oh, we have data on BMI and then in the same group where we evaluated the, uh, the neutral effect on the endometrium, we evaluated also the effect on the bone, the effect on the bone and the parameters of bone resorption are reduced by uh, by the administration of the HA, mm -hmm. but also for that one, you need to reach at least one year of treatment because otherwise, you know, it's not some, it's not an acute effect. Mm -hmm. No. Um, Angelica, um, so if you have a lady that maybe isn't responding brilliantly to vaginal estrogen, uh, do you think it's a good option to switch her to prasterone to see if she has a better effect? Or would you, first of all, perhaps increase the dose 
of the estrogen, uh, the, the topical estrogen? Yeah, it, it depends on her symptoms uh, and uh, if it's about vaginal dryness, uh, I personally believe that uh, estrogen alone uh, with um, uh, the adequate dose uh, is the best treatment. Mm. Uh, but if, if she's also complaining of um, sexual dysfunction, uh, I, I would suggest to her to try topical yes. DGA. Be because of the data on FSFI, you mean? Yeah, uh, I think it's really interesting, but uh, mm. it's difficult to explain what would the mechanism be. But uh, sure. Uh, but it, it uh, I think it's important to to study it further. Mm. Yes. So yeah. one of the uh, well, I have oh, something on this point also. I think it will be is very important also the effect on the muscular tissue. Because, you know, mm. the vagina, mostly in coital activity, the vagina is not only the thickness of the, of the vaginal cells, but mostly is the resistance of the lamina propria and the thickness of the muscular structure, because the yes. necessary uh, need an organ able to accept. And mm. this is not only the mucosa, this is also the, the other part. And, and we mustn't only talk about uh, osteopenia, we must talk about sarcopenia as well and the potential benefits there. Mm. So one of the running debates that I always have with my Italian colleagues is that in the UK, we tend to use testosterone more than we do DHEA. Um, so where would you say the balance lies between recommending systemic testosterone plus or minus estrogen uh, versus DHEA? We have not uh, the experience that you have in UK. We are using testosterone local administration for uh, its effects on external genitalia, which is are absolutely mm. very profound. The labia maiora, minora, the clitoris, uh, all the external genitalia strongly improve by the administration of local testosterone. But, and we do by local creams. Uh, we don't have experience uh, as you have uh, with general yes. testosterone. Mm. In my um, experience, I think testosterone is, is the most strongest and, and mm. the effect uh, uh, is more um, clear, so to say. And mm. I think uh, systemic DHEA, uh, if you want to have a, a milder androgenic effect, I think it's good to start with, with that treatment. And I think the... The frustrating thing is the lack of licensed products within each category, um, apart from one in Australia. But um, mm. you know, we need we need uh, more licensed products so that people feel comfortable to use these preparations. And maybe um, lesser risk for negative side effects with, with systemic DHA compared to testosterone. So the final question I'd like to ask both of you is, um, and this sort of fits in with the theme of the webinar, um, is this potentially an elixir of youth? Um, and there's a question from Frederick Naftalin again about, you know, how long it can be continued. Can it be continued into old age, the DHEA? And actually another question that I have is, if we are using systemic DHEA, could there be, as there can be with estrogen, a benefit to using topical with systemic DHEA to get a particularly good topical effect? So that's two questions, I guess. I will. Angelica first. And there you start. <laughs> okay. I, will, I will tell you, okay, we, when we have done that study using 10 milligram only DHEA with the uh, uh, patch with a transdermal patch and 100 milligram progesterone per day. This was done just to show the advantages of a co-administration. Of a co-administration, I think we have to remind that women, independent that they are women, are different from men. But also, women have always higher androgen concentration in their body in comparison to estrogen. And the androgen lack who happen during the life um, clearly modify also the, uh, also the total body response and structure. And then I am in favor of a co-administration, but also this one, you know, as we have no studies, we have no randomized clinical trial, we have no, then I go only in those who have already a reduction of circulating DHEA sulfate. 
I think if we follow that, if you have lower concentration also to what is expected at your age, then I have a reason to give you uh, to give you a supply. And concerning the duration, I have patients who are above their eighth decade of life who are still continuing, who are still continuing, mostly for the muscular effect and for the effect of the total body, not so much for sexuality, you know, because uh, they have also, sometimes it's lost in the dark, the sexuality, but, uh, but uh, the total effect on mood, the total effect on mood, on attitude, on cardiovascular system, I think I am strongly in favor, as you see also in my recent publication, on, of menopause hormone therapy. But I believe that menopause hormone therapy has to include also androgens if you have mm. any symptom of androgen failure. Yeah, I agree. Angelica? Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, the only clear indication for testosterone treatment is, is uh, reduced sexual function in libido. I mean, we have no other, uh, we, we do not have evidence, evidence for treating for other indications actually. Mm. So, so, but, but still uh, I really agree that uh, there are several patient uh, groups that uh, really benefit uh, from treatment of either DGA or testosterone, like uh, women with premature ovarian insufficiency, uh, pituitary deficiency, and, and the, there are several groups, and, and they, they do not even have um, uh, measurable levels of androgens. So, and, and uh, according to my clinical experience, uh, uh, if they are willing to try, uh, about about half of the women they will never stop after they have tried mm. <laughs> but uh, the other half maybe feel ah it was a little bit positive but uh, then i got these side effects so maybe i i don't want to continue so so it, it's different but uh, i really think there is a place for this treatment in the clinic mm. yes um I think uh, that old adage, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, uh, always rears its head and we always need better studies and we do have to be mindful of the indications. But I think particularly for women who have not just spontaneous premature menopause, but also surgical, you know, and they lose sure, sure. considerable androgen production, it's particularly uh, appropriate uh, to consider it as part of your treatment armamentarium. Well, um, with that, uh, I think our, our time is drawing near. So I would like to thank the ISGE for providing us with a wonderful series of webinars. Uh, I'd like to very much thank our great speakers today, Professor Genizani and Professor Hirschberg. Um, thank you to you delegates for tuning in. And uh, we all hope to see you face to face in Florence, uh, don't we, Andrea? Um, God permitting. Yes. <laughs> God willing. Yeah. We are waiting you, we are waiting you. It will be a fantastic Congress. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as you know, uh, start uh, the 11th to the 14th of uh, May. We have chosen May also because uh, to try to leave the pandemic back in the winter and then, and then to be in the spring, uh, uh, close to the summertime and enjoy together. I thank very much Professor Nick Panay for to have uh, accepted to chair this session and Professor Kishner for her participation. And I invite all of you to the next uh, webinar, which uh, will be, uh, I don't have yet the date here. And then uh, uh, in two weeks from now, we will have another one where another hard topic will be discussed. Thank you very much, Nick, Angelica, thank you very much. And thanks to all more than 250 who are still with us now here. Goodbye to everybody. Enjoy the life. Take care. Goodbye. Make the right Ciao. Decision. Ciao a tutti. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.